We've got a 12th grader from Virginia, a ninth grader from Florida. This is high school and college level. So I have some college professors on here as well as um, college students. So it's awesome. Government teacher from Virginia, 12th grade. Awesome, nice. Very cool. Sixth to 12th grade juvenile detention in Virginia. Awesome. 10th grade, Louisiana. Nice to see my Louisiana people in here too. Good, good, very fun. So Diane, I'm just gonna ask you real quick, is everything okay? Do you need, um, did you start the live stream? So are you guys, I'm talking to Diana, hey, she's our Curry, producer. can you, can you yeah. hear me? Yes, I can. <laughs> I was saying in the chat box, yeah, we're all set to go and we're live. I made you host again. Great. Okay. So I'm going to make you back to attendee if that's cool with you. Yes. My musical theater headshot can disappear now. <laughs> <laughs> I love your musical theater headshot. I'm like, that's so great. So everybody just, I'm just chatting with um, uh, Diana, who's our head of social media, who is live streaming this session. So as you all know, um, we live stream the one o'clock session and we I can change you to attendee. It's giving a little bit of trouble. And and we also um, record it. There you go. Ah, and there's Jeff Rosen. That's awesome. <laughs> and Jeff, we have about four minutes before we start. So this is nice timing for you. <laughs> okay. So I know there's some teachers checking in with your students in the chat box and that's great. Um, it's a good thing to check in and see which students are here. Students, just to let you know, if you did log on under your teacher's login, um, you will come up as their name. So Jeff and I like to make sure we share who asked the question. So if you want to just put a dash and then your first name, well, I can make sure that we read it with your name on it. If you don't want to do that and keep it anonymous, that's cool too. Uh, we'll start in about four minutes and um, open up your chat box, give it a practice go. Let me know if you want to share which state you're in and which grade. That's awesome. Um, and it's, it's, Good to know who's online with us. Hi, Jeff Rosen. How's everything going for you? Everything is great, Curry. Um, great. Awesome. You're looking excellent outside the Constitution Center. You must be standing <laughs> right next to me because I'm- I know. I was going to change it. I change <laughs> it up each time. Um, and Nick doesn't have a background, so I can pick whatever I want. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I might change it to inside. Hi, everybody. Hi, Virtue. Yes. <laughs> Senior from Washington State, great. Hi, Maggie, hi, Meg. I know, I know, I love this part. This is our welcoming session. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, Carl. Okay, three minutes. And just to let everybody know before we get started, and I'll do this at the front end so we that have... Jeff doesn't get interrupted, I will place the hit the record button before we get started today. Um, I thought it was well-timed yesterday, Jeff, but still. <laughs> Isaac said we found our virtue. Absolutely, Isaac, we have. We found it by gathering here together and cultivating our faculties of reason together. And we're glad to have virtue with us to help us do that. Everybody else who wasn't on that session is like, what are they talking about? <laughs> Great, two more minutes, we'll get started. As we go through this, if you guys have constitutional questions for Jeff, you can absolutely also use the Q&A box because I know sometimes that chat can get a little too chatty um, and the Q&A box kind of like laser focuses on some of your questions. So about two minutes, we'll get moving and we'll get started on the Fourth Amendment. Ready to do this, Jeff? You know it. We love the Fourth Amendment. We can't get enough of it. <laughs> I know. Uh, so let's get started. Um, number one, the first thing I'm going to let everybody know is today's session will be recorded. So here is your official recording statement. 
So welcome everybody. Hi, I'm Curry Sautner from the National Constitution Center and I'm so glad to have everybody online with us today. Today is our fourth amendment online class with Jeff Rosen and the National Constitution Center. So today we are going to look at search and seizure in the fourth amendment and over time in America. And we're gonna be going through a ton of awesome cases and founding stories. I like to remind everybody that after this session, we will send you out a brief that walks you through every story Jeff tells, as well as all the court cases, and we'll give you links to the Interactive Constitution. We'll give you links to our online videos and materials so you can read up on it and dive deeper in areas that you find really interesting. And But we're hoping by the end of the day, you're going to be mind blown and you'll click on everything. Um, but we want to make sure that you know this so you don't get too worried about taking notes and know that we'll give you some tools to back up all this learning today and all this fun. Today, like I said, we're going to talk about the founding stories. We're going to ask these big constitutional questions. And my favorite question on the fourth is always thinking about the government. Can they do that? So that's what always pops up into my head when I think about the Fourth Amendment. And I think about searches and seizures. But we also want to have a dialogue with you all. So make sure you're using that chat box to ask questions about what Jeff is talking about. We're going to poll you in that chat box as well. And then if you have a constitutional question, and that's really a question focused on may the government do that? Does the Constitution allow the government to do that? I want you to put those questions in the Q&A box. We had a, just had a conversation with our middle school group in the last hour, and I had to make it really clear that their, their parents aren't the government, and they don't have to follow the Fourth Amendment. <laughs> and so there's a difference between what your parents can do and what the government can do. I'm not talking for your parents. I'm just talking about the government today. So without further ado, let's get started. Jeff Rosen. Thank you so much, Curry. And that's exactly the right question to begin with. Can they do that? Can the government stop you on the street? Uh, the government represented by a police officer. Can officers of the government search your car or your desk or even your computer? Can they look at who you've called on the telephone or where you've been as you walk around on the street or what you've written in your private diary? These are all the crucial questions that we're gonna talk about today. In order to answer them, we have to focus on the words of the Fourth Amendment themselves. So I'm gonna read those inspiring words. These are the words that sparked the American Revolution. That's how important the prohibition against searches and seizures were when in the 17, 60s, the British government began to search through people's homes and desks to see whether or not they would paid the hated tea taxes that sparked the Boston Tea Party. A man named James Otis denounced these instruments of tyranny, and John Adams said of James Otis's speech, at that moment, the child revolution was born. So that's how important our discussion is today. Okay, I'm going to read the words, listen to them closely, and then I'm going to ask you uh, a couple of can they do that questions and ask you to vote. Okay, here we go. These are the words of the Fourth Amendment. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the people or things to be seized. Okay, that's a lot of words, but it's two big ideas and they're contained in two separate clauses. The first is the unreasonable searches and seizures clause. And the second is the warrant clause. The unreasonable searches and seizures clause says uh, that the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And then the second clause, the warrant clause says, if you are going to search someone's person, house, papers, or effects, you better get a warrant to do that. And to get a warrant, you have to have probable cause that particularly describes the place to be searched or the person or things to be seized. In other words, you can't just say, I want a warrant to search someone's house because I've got a hunch that they're doing something bad. You have to have probable cause. That means it's more likely than not that they're violating the law. You've got to 
present that evidence to a magistrate before he'll issue the warrant. And in addition to that, you can't get a warrant that allows the government to search anywhere in your house. The warrant has to particularly describe the place to be searched or the person or things to be seized. Otherwise, the government could be just like those instruments of tyranny in the American Revolution, where the king's agents could go into anyone's house and look anywhere to see whether or not they paid taxes, reading their private diaries and indicting them or arresting them for criticizing the king for a crime completely separate from the one that they'd originally started off to investigate. So now that's just our first take on the first two big clauses of the Fourth Amendment. Now I want to ask you a very basic, can they do that question? Yeah, all of you are learning at home now during this challenging time. Some of you are going to public schools. Let's imagine that the government and your, your teachers, unlike your parents, if you go to public school, are representatives of the government. In that sense, they are public officials bound by the Fourth Amendment. Let's say your teachers wanted to make sure that you actually were logging on to this class and uh, listening to it the way that you promised to do it. Could they issue a subpoena to, to the National Constitution Center and ask us to turn over the Zoom recordings that actually show your chat and might indicate whether or not you've logged in. I actually don't know whether we've recorded your names uh, by name. I think we haven't, and we certainly don't collect or keep that information. Curry's saying, oh my I gosh, totally Jeff, why are you making this up? I totally have this. <laughs> I'm not, I am so not big brother, nor the government, so. <laughs> okay, but let's imagine instead of the incredible Curry that you see there, who is, cares about your privacy and has got your back at every turn, you had, uh, a wicked National Constitution <laughs> Center that was keeping your names and now they're all had, a, had a list of them. And uh, your teachers uh, didn't have a warrant and didn't have probable cause, but they issued a subpoena to us to turn over your names to prove whether or not you've been, there, you've been to class. Can they do that? Can the government determine whether or not you are watching the Zoom in your home by asking for the records or whether or not you logged in? Okay, no, we, okay we said no, no. Uh, we had, uh, yes, Curry reminded you what you're Sorry, saying. Sorry, no, putting you, it in. <laughs> teachers make you turn over your names to check your attendance? Yes, says Robert. Excellent. Well, there's a good um, uh, variety of opinions. Oh, Robert, do you have a, can you quickly chat why you say yes? Yeah, if you guys say yes, do you want to, why, so, the, the school acting as a government agent, can they force the, me or the National Constitution Center to turn over the list of attendees to this? Oh, but and, I and, like and, Anna. And, yeah, Anna, you're right, <laughs> potentially, but I don't agree. That's great, Anna. We're not asking, as you know, whether you agree with it as a policy matter, whether you think it's a good idea. The question is, can they do that? Does, does the Fourth Amendment allow the government to ask for that information, whether or not uh, you think it's a good idea. Always in these discussions, you've got to separate your political from your constitutional views. Great answer, Shannon. Nope, NAACP. We all know that the NAACP case was the one that said that the NAACP did not have to turn over its membership list. Those names could remain anonymous because the thought was that having your name disclosed to the government might chill people from joining the NAACP, infringing on their freedom of association, which we talked about last week. So that's a great point, uh, Shana, but the, the difference though here is that um, you're not gathering in a private association like the NAACP, you're in class and you can't be chilled in attending, you're required to attend by law. So uh, I'd love to hear an argument or two for why uh, some folks say that yes, they can do that and the government can require the National Constitution Center, which is not a government organization, we are a private nonprofit, to turn over your names. And remember, the words of the Fourth Amendment, the right of the people, that's you, you are the people. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. So if you're saying yes, how do you believe that turning over your names while you're in your Zoom class is an unreasonable search of your person, house, papers, or effects, which would it be? So, yeah, so I think it's always really important to go back to that, like that founding error and what were they saying about it? And is this the Constitution being forced to turn over our papers in our house that we're standing in front of? <laughs> uh, 
Afton, it does sound that like Jurassic Park because my neighbors downstairs are having some renovation work done, which is why <laughs> we're <laughs> I'm all using wondering. my microphone when it's not <laughs> howling like that. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm getting some yeses and some noes. There's Anna, because there are so many other ways they can take attendance. Well, that's a great point, Anna. Um, if there's a least restrictive means of getting attendance that doesn't have the uh, ill side benefit of allowing the government to determine, to invade the privacy of your home, to literally peer into the most sanct sacred and protected place that exists and to see whether or not you're sitting at your desk, then you think that the Fourth Amendment requires the government to uh, take that least restrictive means. And that idea of judging the reasonableness of the search by balancing its effectiveness against its necessity is something that jurors in the founding era did all the time, and that is crucial. Uh, Jonathan says this is being uploaded to YouTube, so I expect my privacy has already been lost. Well, that's a really important point too, Jonathan. On the one hand, Curry told you, she put you on notice, this is being recorded, and you know the public part of the chat will be on YouTube, but your personal chats, Jonathan, what you just said is not recorded on our YouTube feed, but you believe that by turning over evidence, uh, turning over data to a third party like YouTube, which is owned by Google, you're abandoning expectation of privacy in that data. And that's a crucial point because the Supreme Court in cases like Smith versus Maryland in the 1970s, held that when I turn over data to a third party for one purpose, I lose all expectation of privacy in it for other purposes. And Smith involved uh, uh, d uh, d telephone calling records and held that when I make a phone call, the phone call is recording the number I called and I basically voluntarily turned over that number to the phone company. And therefore I can't uh, expect that the phone company won't share that with the government. And then in this follow-up case, United States versus Miller, which you see on the screen, the court went further and said that when I turn over bank records to the bank, I have abandoned expectation of privacy and I've assumed the risk that the bank will turn over evidence of my finances to the government. Can they do that? Do you think that Miller and Smith were correctly decided? Do you agree with this so-called third party doctrine that when you surrender your data to a third party like YouTube, or the National Constitution Center, or your bank, you abandon all expectation of privacy in it. Can they do that, asks Curry. So you guys can vote now. I know it's always my favorite one for this. Um, do you think that, can they do that? Can, you're giving your banking information over, can they then say, oh, I'll give it to the government. Are they allowed to do that? And um, Lana says it would, does, do not believe that they have any privacy anymore. So. That's true. And um, I think, was it Anna a little bit up who said it depends on which company and the type. It depends on the company and the type. Great point, Anna, because a lot of your privacy when it comes to private companies, as you suggest, is determined by the terms of service agreement. So when you sign up for uh, uh, iTunes, you consent to their sharing your data for some purposes, but not others. Some of you may have seen that Twitter recently changed its terms of service. When I signed on the other day, I got a little pop-up screen that says, hey, we're changing our terms of service. Click here to accept. I didn't have any option. I could, I could have not used Twitter, but if I wanted to, I had to accept their new terms of service. So to some degree, every all of our privacy, as Anna suggests, when it comes to private companies, is determined by private contract. And any notion that this is voluntary is illusory. If you want to use Twitter or Apple or iTunes, as many of us do. And the other thing is, who has actually ever read a privacy contract or term of service? I'm going to confess something now. I'm supposed to know something about privacy because I teach the Fourth <laughs> Amendment. I have never read one of those privacy contracts. They're very long and it's a lot of boilerplate. And I really want to get onto Twitter or use my iPhone and I click through that screen just the way I think most other people do. So any notion of informed consent or thoughtful weighing of the options is uh, imaginary. And in practice, Anna points to something very crucial, which is that when it comes to uh, our speech online, which is generally determined by private companies, so much of what we uh, expect is governed by private contracts. Jeff, just a question for you. I think it was Rand Paul that talked about at some point in time when they become so long and so convoluted, 
Is it then in itself that these laws or the, I believe he was talking about laws at the time, but these contracts get so long and so hard for people to understand that it's not even feasible to for the public? I mean, we're all confessing that we don't read it and we should, but is there a balance between what is feasible for somebody to read and understand and what is unfeasible in these contracts? Well, Rand Paul may be correct in, in practice for the reasons I just said. I mean, I, I don't think it's very feasible to ask even lawyers or law professors to read them. But the Supreme Court has not been sympathetic to notions of meaningful consent. And it has repeatedly rejected the claim that the police need to inform you of your right to refuse consent before they search a, uh, a part of your car or even your person that uh, requires consent. So for example, the police, if they stop you for uh, turning without uh, signaling, may have the right to uh, search the interior of your car, but they don't have the right to search closed containers uh, such as the trunk without some kind of individual suspicion that there's something wrong in the trunk. However, if the police say, hey, do you mind if I search your trunk? And you say, yeah, go ahead, because you're scared. They can do that, and they don't have to tell you that you have the right to say no. So that's kind of counterintuitive, mm -hmm. and it goes against what Rand Paul suggested. Uh, the Fourth Amendment is not a self-executing document. We all have to know our rights in order to exercise them. I tell my law students, the most practical advice you can get from a criminal procedure class, uh, you, and you don't even have to pay law school tuition for me to share it with you. If you're ever being interrogated by the police or if they're asking you serious questions, say these magic words, I want a lawyer. Once you say those magic words, I want a lawyer, then all sorts of rights kick in and the police are not allowed to question you any further until you have had a chance to talk to a lawyer and been advised about your rights. It, even if you're innocent, which I'm sure you all are, you may be being uh, questioned by the police and they could twist your words against you. I'm not telling you to be uncooperative, but if you really feel like they might be fishing for something and might think that you've done something that you haven't, say the magic words, I want a lawyer, and then you're just, all sorts of rights kick in. So these are not intuitive, and that's why we need to have this class so that we can study our rights together and meaningfully exercise them. Okay, okay so, so question well, for you. I love yes. the technology, I love all these pieces, and but I go back to we're, they clearly weren't thinking the same thing that we're thinking about wiretap, it, whoa, phone records and third party doctrine. When we go back to Madison, when we go back to, you know, 1791, when the Bill of Rights was ratified, what were they thinking about the Fourth Amendment back then? I like to always use our way back machine and go back in time and say, like, in that time period, what were their worries and concerns about the government searching and seizing their ideas, their papers, their their property. I'm giving Jeff a minute to uh, get his headphone back on because you're now I'm muted. Just, I was <laughs> walking away from the renovation noise and hope I'm still in front of the National Constitution Center, but hopefully it'll be a little quieter. So what were the framers uh, thinking about? There are two great stories to tell about the Fourth Amendment, and they're so exciting because they were so galvanizing to the uh, people who wrote the Fourth Amendment. Of the first one uh, I began to tell, and that's the story of uh, John uh, of uh, James Otis and the writs of assistance. So it is uh, 1761, and the city is Boston. The British Empire is imposing these new taxes on the American colonists. The colonists are angry, and many of them refuse to pay. King George uses his royal officials, and he issues these so-called writs of assistance. What are they? They're basically a blank check to the government the royal agents, to uh, go into anyone's home to search for evidence anytime, anywhere, and for any reason. They didn't particularly specify the place to be searched or the person or things to be seized. They just said, go search in someone's home and see if you can find any evidence that they've done something wrong, including not paying these taxes. So enter James Otis. He's a Boston lawyer. He's a patriot. He gives a speech denouncing the writs of assistance um, saying that the unregulated search of people's houses violates the fundamental rights of all free people. He says, it's a power that places the liberty of every man in the hands of every petty officer. And John Adams is in the courtroom. He's taking notes. 
And later in describing the scene, he calls it the first scene of the first act of opposition to the arbitrary claims of Great Britain. Then and there, he says, the child of independence was born. An amazing story. And it reminds us how galvanizing the writs of assistance were to the framers. Now let's go back uh, across the Atlantic and fast forward two years to 1763. Uh, and now we can tell the story of John Wilkes. Uh, some of you from Pennsylvania know about Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. Many of you know about the assassin of Abraham Lincoln, John Wilkes Booth. All of these towns and cities were named after John Wilkes, who was a British Tory and rabble rouser who wrote an anonymous pamphlet. Back to was it Shannon's question about the NAACP. People were writing anonymous pamphlets back in the 1760s, and his pamphlet criticized King George. It said that King George's mother, the Queen, was having an affair with the Foreign Secretary, Lord Bute. The King was furious, and he said, go find out who wrote this seditious pamphlet. A seditious pamphlet means a pamphlet that criticizes the King. Sedition is criticizing uh, royal officials. Uh, under the British law of the time, you can't plead in defense to sedition that the pamphlet was true. The greater the crime, the, the greater the truth, the worse the offense, according to uh, the law at the time. So armed with, in this case, a general warrant, which is like a writ of assistance, it basically allows the royal agents to look in people's houses for evidence of crime without any uh, particularity of description of place or things. The king's agents break into lots of people's houses. They finally get to Wilkes's house. They look in his desk drawers. They find the printing plates for North Britain 45, which was the pamphlet criticizing the king. They arrest him for seditious libel. He goes before a jury. He pleads that the most intimate secrets of his bosom have been exposed to the world and that searches of his home violate the common law rights of Englishmen. And the jury gives him a thousand pounds, which is a hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in today's money. Uh, vindicating the principle that general warrants that don't particularly specify places or things to be searched or seized are invalid and the king's agents are liable in trespass. And this case is so exciting for the colonists that they name not only towns and cities like uh, Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania and John Wilkes Booth, but also Camden, New Jersey in honor of Lord Camden, who's the uh, 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 judge in the case. Uh, uh, they have parties where people drink 45 steins of beer to celebrate liberty. And this case is burned into the consciousness of the colonists. And it leads a series of revolutionary era state constitutions to prohibit general warrants and writs of assistance. And now I'm just gonna read to you a few of the uh, analogs of the Fourth Amendment in revolutionary era state constitutions. After this discussion, I hope you'll go online to the interactive constitution of the Constitution Center and click on the drafting table feature, which is so exciting because it'll show you the early drafts of the amendments in the state constitution analogs, and you'll be able to see this language yourself. Uh, but uh, I'm just gonna call out two right now, the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which is a good place to start because Madison had it by his side when he wrote the Bill of Rights and Jefferson when he wrote the Declaration of Independence banned quote, general warrants whereby an officer or messenger may be commanded to search suspected places without evidence of fact committed. So that's a good definition of a general warrant. If you have a search without evidence of fact committed, then uh, the, the warrant is presumptively invalid. But even more salient or relevant is the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, uh, which sounds a lot like the Fourth Amendment. It's got more words. This is gonna take me a moment to read, but listen closely to the words because they will give you a very precise sense of what the founders were trying to prohibit. The Massachusetts Constitution says, every subject has a right to be secure from all unreasonable searches and seizures of his persons, his houses, his papers, and all his possessions. So now we know that an effect is like a possession. Then it goes on to say, all warrants therefore are contrary to this right if the cause or foundation of them be not previously supported by oath or affirmation, and if the order in the warrant to a civil officer to make a search in suspected places or to arrest one or more suspected persons or to seize their property 
be not accompanied with a special designation of the person or objects of search, arrest, or seizure. So that was a lot of words in that sentence, but just to review it, it just said, it said the warrants are invalid, both unless they have a cause or foundation that's supported by oath or affirmation, and the order to the civil officer, that is the person who's conducting the search, to make the search in a particular place or to arrest somebody or to seize their property isn't accompanied by a special designation or a very specific description of the people or objects of the search, arrest, or seizure. Now we're getting a sense of it. One more sentence. And no warrant ought to be issued, but in cases and with the formalities prescribed by the laws. That last sentence is really important because it reminds us that for the framers, warrants were bad things. They were instruments of tyranny. They could potentially immunize um, from trespass suits, author, uh, king's agents who broke into your house. So therefore, unless the warrant uh, abides by all the formalities prescribed by the law and particularly describes the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized, then the warrant can't be issued in the first place. And it has to be supported by probable cause that the crime has been committed. So nowadays we think of warrants as the test of whether or not a search is unreasonable. If there's no warrant, we presume the search is unreasonable. Whereas in those days, warrants were so bad, so scary, so terrifying that the, the framers wanted to establish a very high bar for the conditions under which they should be issued. So that's the history. And um, Curry, what do you make of all that? And what, is, what, what do our uh, friends make? Let's look at the chat. Yeah, so uh, um, there's a couple questions in the Q&A box too that I kind of wanted to jump around to because it was, what, what do they mean by searching and seizing and what, what is the, the difference? What I'm hearing the questions are really about is what's the difference between probable cause and needing a warrant? Like, where's that line? So um, somebody asked like, just because they really want to, is that enough? No, that's not enough, <laughs> uh, meaning like the police. But in other words, showing your badge or describing the incident or cause in which you are invading someone's privacy isn't enough. So where is that level? And I know it, it could be, is it different for somebody walking down the street? Is it different for somebody um, going into somebody's house? Or is it different when we think about going into somebody's possessions that could be on them when they're walking down the street? And that's why I kind of poked up Brandeis here to think about how we keep in this modern age our papers and belongings and our objects you know, that we just were looking at in that Massachusetts written piece. They were talking about things, but t the way we keep things today is very different than in 1791. So, so a, little, a little clarifying is when can you search for the right reasons? When do you need a warrant? And what can you search? That's a lot, sorry. Great <laughs> questions. And they're such great questions that they're exactly what uh, we learn in first year criminal procedure classes in law school. The whole structure of criminal procedure is we start, I start off just the way I just did. Hey, the framers were scared of warrants. They wanted to make sure that they were precisely defined. But nowadays, you generally have to have a warrant before you can do a search. And then we spend the rest of the term talking about all the exceptions to the warrant requirement. And there are many of the ones that you uh, friends are signaling. So Jack, you say, so if I have drugs at my house and the police want to search for my house due to some report, but they don't have a search warrant. I can ask them to come back with a warrant and flush the drugs down the toilet during that time. No, you can't do that because the courts have come up with the so-called exigent circumstances exception to the warrant requirement. So there's an exigent circumstance. If the police legitimately fear destruction of evidence, then they can enter the home without a warrant. And that's so that you can't flush your drugs down the toilet. And then we get into a whole uh, important area of law about do they have to knock on the door before they break it down and come in without a warrant to seize your drugs? Or are there even exceptions to the knock and announce rule where the thought that even knocking on the door would give you a chance to flush your drugs down the toilet, in which case they can break your door down with a battering ram without even knocking? So that's uh, Jack, great question. And, and what about some other exceptions? So in other words, Craig says, showing your badge or describing the incident or cause in which you're invading someone's privacy is not enough. No, it is not enough. The mere fact that you're a police officer doesn't entitle you to do a search generally. You, you, generally, you need a warrant. However, there's a very important series of exceptions to the warrant requirement that have to do with uh, a stop and frisk or pat downs. Um, the police have the right, if they think that you're 
uh, doing something suspicious on the street and have reasonable cause to suspect wrongdoing to ask you to stop and to pat you down uh, and in the course of patting you down to ensure that you are, don't have contraband or weapons or other evidence of wrongdoing that might threaten the officer's safety. And if they feel while patting you down something that they suspect might be a weapon, then they can remove it. And uh, if it is a weapon and you're holding it illegally, they can arrest you for it. Now that's a huge exception to the warrant requirement. It comes from a case called Terry versus Ohio. And it almost seems like an exception that swallows the rule. You've all heard of stop and frisk. You know how controversial that policy is. Mayor Bloomberg, who led that uh, initiative in New York to have a lot of stop and frisk stops, later apologized for it and said it was a mistake because it disproportionately affected uh, minorities. And um, a stop is not a minor thing. In class, when I teach it, I sometimes ask students to act out the Terry case, which involved this guy who was casing a department store and he was walking up and down the street and trying to see whether or not he could break in. And this police officer who notices him walking up and down the street figures he's casing the joint. So he walks up to him, he spins him around, he throws his arms against the wall, he pats him down in this thick overcoat, he reaches inside his coat, pulls out contraband, it's inside. It is humiliating, it's frightening, obviously, to be stopped on the street and physically manhandled by the police. And that's why this is a very big exception to the warrant requirement and allows the police to stop you, not with probable cause and with a warrant, but these protective searches that are called Terry stops, they can conduct merely on the lower standard of reasonable suspicion. And then we have someone asking an anonymous attendee, appropriately given our topic, you're, you're very welcome to be here anonymously and you can ask questions anonymously. Can you search something without a warrant if someone gives consent, like a family member or the owner of the property? Yes, you can. Generally, say uh, uh, I'm going out and uh, after this class I go out, my, my wife, Lauren, is still here. And if the police come and knock on the door and say, hey, is Jeff home? No, she says. Please say, hey, do you mind if we just look around? We think we might find some evidence of really bad teaching and we want to uh, prosecute them for it. <laughs> and she says, they say, you mind if we come in? And she says, no, sure, go ahead. You, you're welcome to look around. And they find evidence of my criminally bad teaching. Well, they can use that against me because, uh, because she has constructive authority over the home. It's her house just as much as it is mine and she's allowed to give consent. Now there are all sorts of really interesting cases about what happens if you know, a, a, a cousin is just stopping by the house and you go out and the cousin says, sure, look around to the police, even though he doesn't have constructive authority or a, you know, a girlfriend who, or a boyfriend who you later break up with, or maybe it's just a neighbor who's hanging out who doesn't have constructive authority. So it's not always clear who has the constructive authority to authorize the search, but uh, Lauren could definitely let the police look for my evidence of bad teaching. And she's just in the uh, kitchen right now. I'm gonna make sure that she does not do that. So if the police come looking for that evidence, they will never find it. I think you have home. a lot of future lawyers on the chat box too that are ready to free you if you okay. get into any trouble. Okay, well, I There's hope, a I'm whole free count on you guys. <laughs> They you are count. on your side. You can just testify for me. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. So I, Jeff, as we get into the, like this next section about where and like where papers, where belongings, and where people can stop you, the other question that I have is how does it change depending on if you're in school or out of school? I mean, right now I get we're all out of school, but there was a couple of questions on the side, and I'm trying to remember who exactly asked. Like Maggie was, what about public property? Can police just go onto any public property and search it? Um, and then what about in schools? And is school considered a public property? Uh, great questions. Schools are a really important uh, series of questions, but we have one pleading question from the chat box, which is uh, from Cassidy. C uh, please, 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 please talk about hot pursuit. Yes, I can. That's a wonderful nice. question. How could you not? And hot pursuit is also relevant to the question of where the police can be on public property because um, Hot pursuit is an exception to the warrant requirement. So hot pursuit provides that the police can enter premises where they suspect uh, that a crime has been committed without a warrant when delay would endanger their lives or the lives of others and lead to the escape of the alleged perpetrator. It's also sometimes So this would called, count for a house too, because somebody asked that question. It, it, would, in, it would indeed. Got so it. hot pursuit, if they're chasing you on the street and they're following you 
and you come into the house, they, uh, they don't have to stop at the, at the door. They can follow you into the house because if they don't, then the perpetrator could escape or someone could get hurt. Uh, so that would be one uh, exception. Um, and uh, then the question is what happens if they get into the house without a warrant legitimately under the hot pursuit doctrine and they find that the person who is fleeing actually isn't guilty of a crime, but they see evidence of some other crime committed by someone else in the house, like marijuana, that doesn't belong to the guy who is fleeing, but to his roommate. Uh, and they realize it's the roommate. Can they arrest the roommate for the marijuana? And the answer is yes. If the police are uh, have the authority to be in a place, they can seize any evidence they see that's in plain view. That's another exception called the plain view doctrine. So they're in the house validly. They don't have to get a warrant because of the hot pursuit doctrine. They see their marijuana in plain view. They can arrest the person for the marijuana. That does not mean that they can turn over uh, keyholes and rummage in desk drawers. That's not plain view. And there was an interesting case uh, written by Justice Anton Scalia where the police saw an expensive looking stereo. They suspected it might've been stolen. They were legitimately conducting a house search. They lifted up the stereo to see this serial number, which was concealed underneath it. And they concluded based on that, that it was stolen. They arrested the guy for stealing the stereo. And the US Supreme Court excluded that evidence because Justice Scalia said, touching the property to look for this serial number by itself um, takes it out of the realm of plain view. And that was an additional search which required a warrant in that case. So that's a series of interesting exceptions to the warrant requirement that, fl that flow from the hot pursuit doctrine. Now, what so about a couple issues? clarifying on that one? A so, absolutely. can a police? So, Jonathan said, "Can a police look through your windows? Would that count as plain view?" And then there's a really good question about mixing up street addresses and could the yes. information. I know, I love these. You questions. guys, this is perfect. <laughs> these is this is exactly what we study in criminal procedure, and that's why it's so exciting to go to law school and to learn all these cases, but you don't have to go to law school because we can learn them together. So can the police look through <laughs> no, your window? No, you can go to law school, but you can do it with <laughs> us too. <laughs> well, we'll have another, we can have another discussion later about going to law school, but right now we're going to learn the constitution because you do not have to be a lawyer to uh, learn the constitution. All you have to do is love learning the way all you do. So um, can the police look through your windows? Um, it depends. There's a series of cases involving English basements. Do you know what an English basement is? It's you know when you kind of live on a lower level of a house um, and the windows might peak halfway up. So there was a series of cases where, there was one case where a police officer climbed over a hedge because he suspected that something might be going on there. And he looked down and saw through the half exposed window of the English basement, uh, some guys doing drugs in the house. Um, and I believe that, uh, the court was divided about whether that was a plain view search. Some said yes, because anyone passing by on the street could have just looked down and seen it. And others said, no, the fact that he had to climb over a hedge and really peer up to the window, it wasn't the sort of thing that an ordinary passerby would happen to observe in the course of his uh, walking around, but really constituted an extra search. So reasonable justices can disagree about peering through a window, but generally, you certainly can't use binoculars to peer through someone's window. That violates the civil law of torts. But now we have to remember the difference between criminal and civil law. Criminal law uh, to which the Fourth Amendment uh, applies, as it does to civil cases, uh, involves prosecutions for crime. Torts involve wrongs committed between two private citizens rather than crimes, which are uh, involve the exercise of state authority over um, individuals. And if you take binoculars and look in someone's window, that will violate state privacy tort laws because you're not allowed to do that. That's an outrageous violation of privacy. So if the police are kind of using the equivalent of binoculars to look through windows, they can't do that. And then that led to a whole series of fascinating cases involving heat sensing devices. Heat and sensing devices in the soup. That's my other favorite case I want you to talk about. <laughs> um, I will, yes, the, the heat <laughs> sensing device case was um, uh, one decided by Justice Scalia and the police think a guy might be using heat lamps to make, grow marijuana inside his house, but they're not sure. 
So they take these heat sensing devices and they find out that there's a huge amount of heat coming through that walls of one part of his house. And based on that, they figure they do have probable cause to suspect that he's using heat lamps to grow marijuana. They get a warrant and they find absolutely he's growing a lot of marijuana using that heat lamp. But he says, I want to exclude the evidence because it was an unreasonable, unwarranted search of my house to use the heat sensing device to detect the heat that was on the outside walls. And the court again divided on that question, but Justice Scalia wrote the majority opinion. And he said, any cutting edge technology, which might reveal information about the interior of the home presumptively requires a warrant. And Justice Scalia said, for example, that heat sensing device might have revealed the hour of the day that the lady of the house was taking her daily sauna or bath. And people thought that's an interesting uh, image. And some scholars noted the image of the lady in her bath. This comes from classical mythology of Lita and her swan. And maybe Justice Scalia is a classicist. Maybe he got it from that. But his point was that the interior of the home is so sacrosanct that you cannot use technology to reveal information about the interior um, without a warrant. Now, it was a kind of, I was going to use a classical phrase, Pyrrhic victory. You know what the Pyrrhic victory means? It's a victory, another such victory, I am undone. You win in the short term, but in the end, it's only a short term victory because uh, there's going to be defeat down the line. Um, cutting edge technology, today's cutting edge technology is tomorrow's Zoom. We would have all thought it was science fiction. Three years ago, Curry was talking about this new technology, Zoom, where people Ooh. can talk to each other through both sides of the screen. And I said, who would ever use that? And now here we one are. One month ago, this happened. One month one ago. Month ago. <laughs> Absolutely. So technology moves so fast that to say that the technology has to be cutting edge in order to be governed by the warrant requirement isn't all that robust protection, but at least it's something. And that's the heat sensing lamp case. Curry, what's the soup case you want to hear? Oh, the soup case is, and I, and I will not remember the name of the case, but I will send it to everybody. Um, I, a guy was in a, it was like a little tiny restaurant in New York, you know, with all glass windows, and he had a bowl of soup, and a police officer was walking by, and the police officer believed that he dropped his drugs in the soup. So the police officer came in, and he looked through the guy's soup. So the question is there, is that an acceptable search? So I will send everybody that link to that case. Um, that one is kind of mind blowing to me because um, it's your food and you're touching it, um, but it's a really interesting case. So that might be the homework assignment for the day is, you, Curry will send you the link to the soup case, but I want your opinions before you read it. What, do you think this officer had the right to look through that gentleman's soup? Well, I cannot wait to read that case, Curry. I don't know it. Oh, it I know, like, guys. Sorry, it I didn't mean to like jinx. No, it, it's, it's great. a crazy one, right? <laughs> it sounds like a Seinfeld episode. But the main question <laughs> I want to know is: Was it miso soup? Uh, <laughs> or, I don't or, know. I think it. I don't remember. But Oren Kerr spoke about it. A yeah. great um, one of our writers for the. I believe Oren Kerr wrote for our Fourth Amendment explainer. Correct. Uh, yes. Yeah, and he, he writes about it and he was saying something about the broth is, but the broth wasn't clear. So they definitely had to go through it. And it was like, it was a bag of drugs that was in there. And the police officer did find a bag of drugs. Sometimes it's really important to uh, use minestrone. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but these are the, these are real cases and facts turn on them. And it's all part of figuring out what is reasonable. Now, you asked also about school cases, but I want to Yeah, sure. so Craig, uh, Craig Snyder's class is in here, and they would love to know about New Jersey's TL, New Jersey versus TLO. And then um, uh, I want to say it's, it's not Sheffield, but the other case where the young woman, 13-year-old, had Advil, and the school yes. searched her. So those two cases, I think, are really important to look at searches and seizures that happen on school property by school officials. So turning you loose. Great. So the TLO case, very important to talk about because it has to do with your rights as students, um, was decided in 1985. And there's a teacher at a New Jersey high school who um, finds that there's a 14-year-old freshman and she's smoking cigarettes in the school restrooms. So the teacher takes them to the principal's office and she denies she's been smoking. And then the assistant vice principal says, I want, let me see your purse. And the principal opens the purse and finds a pack of cigarettes and also sees cigarette rolling paper that she thinks maybe the student is using uh, in connection with marijuana. 
So the principal then searches the whole purse and actually finds marijuana, a pipe, plastic bags, a lot of money, and, in, and an index card with a list of the students who owed uh, the student money and two letters that implicated her in dealing marijuana. So there's definitely a lot of evidence of it. The state brings delinquency charges. She says it's an unreasonable search of her purse. There was no warrant. What are you doing opening up my purse? And what does the Supreme Court do? It says that the Fourth Amendment does apply to public school officials. It's not limited to searches carried out by law enforcement officers. So the vice principal and other public school teachers are bound by the Fourth Amendment and the, and the searches have to be reasonable. And students do have some reasonable expectations of privacy, but they have less privacy than adults. Of course, you suspected this would be the punchline and it was. Uh, the teachers have to balance the students' legitimate expectation of privacy and the school's legitimate need to maintain a, a healthy learning environment. So therefore, school officials, including your teachers, if you go to public school, don't have to get a warrant before searching students who are under their authority. They don't even need to have the searches based on probable cause to believe that the student has violated the law. Instead, the court said the legality of the search of a student should depend simply on the reasonableness under all circumstances of the search. And determining the reasonableness involves whether the search was justified at its inception, in other words, whether there's some reason to suspect the student at the beginning of the search, and whether as conducted, the search was reasonably related in scope to the circumstances that justified the inference in the first place. In other words, if you were looking for uh, not cigarettes, but a huge, I don't know, stone that someone had thrown to um, hurt someone, you couldn't open up a tiny pocket in the purse because you couldn't fit a big stone in a tiny pocket. But so the search can't be unlimited. It has to be justified at its inception and reasonably related in scope to the circumstances that justified the inference. But what's so important about the TLO case is we now have three different standards for searching. One is a warrant uh, where you go to a magistrate and present probable cause that a, a crime has been committed and then get the warrant. The second is a search justified by probable cause without a warrant. And there are a whole series of exceptions to the warrant requirement that nevertheless require a degree of probable cause. And probable cause is more likely than not. It's more than a 50% chance that a crime has been committed. And then there's the reasonable suspicion standard. And that's the one that applies to students. More like 50-50, if there's some reason to suspect a crime, then you can generally search the uh, suspicious object or container um, as long as the search is justified at its inception and reasonably related in scope to the original suspicion. So that's the TLO case. And the second case involved Samantha Redding. And this is an amazing case um, that the Supreme Court decided recently. And what's so uh, important about it is it was decided on a case where there was just one woman on the court. That was Justice Ginsburg. And it was decided when, uh, during the period when uh, Justice O'Connor had resigned and it was before Justices Kagan and Sotomayor had been appointed. And therefore, Justice Ginsburg is the only justice on the court. And Samantha Redding is an eighth grader at the Safford Middle School. She's strip searched by school officials on the basis of a tip by another student that she might have ibuprofen, uh, which is a violation of school privacy. And she filed suit about this strip search, which she said was incredibly humiliating and unreasonable. And uh, the um, Supreme Court agreed with her. And in an eight to one decision, the only dissenter was Justice Thomas. The Supreme Court said that Savannah Redding's Fourth Amendment rights were violated when the school officials searched her underwear for these non-prescription painkillers. Uh, the court reiterated that based on reasonable suspicion, according to the TLO case, search measures used by school officials to find drugs must be reasonably related to the objectives of the search and not excessively intrusive in light of the age and sex of the student and nature of the infraction. Here, school officials didn't have sufficient suspicion to warrant uh, searching her underwear. Uh, the court said that was completely unreasonable. And if they were uh, looking for um, uh, a tip that she might have ibuprofen, there was no possible reason to, to subject her to such a humiliating and invasive search. Here's what was really interesting about this case. During the oral argument, remember there are eight male justices and one woman justice, Justice Ginsburg. And the men are kind of joking around. And Justice Breyer at one point said, 
I mean, what's the big deal? When I was in school and I went to the gym, people put things in my underwear all the time. And everyone kind of laughed awkwardly and you know, it wasn't exactly clear what he was talking about. But then Justice Ginsburg spoke up and she said, essentially, this is not a joke at all. It is extremely humiliating for a young woman, a 14 year old uh, woman or an eighth grader to be strip searched, to have her underwear searched is humiliating, it is degrading, and it is especially unreasonable given the circumstances of a young woman being searched by uh, school officials. And Justice Souter took that caution on board when he wrote the opinion. So there's a, uh, Justice Ginsburg often cites that as an example of why it's important to have women on the Supreme Court. A woman's perspective uh, is unique and she understood the indignity of the search in a way that Justice Breyer and the other justices, male justices didn't, and that was reflected in that decision. And since this is the second year of the woman, <laughs> in the anniversary of the 19th Amendment is this August, it's the 100th anniversary. That is my favorite court case for Fourth Amendment and for RGB, just speaking about like how different perspectives and different life experiences matter when you're looking at these experiences with these children have had that come to the court. So thank you. It is my favorite story. As awful as it is, it's it's a great one to share that. Are you ready for the speed round of student questions? You know it. Okay, there is a lot in here. So let's go. Um, let's see. Is there some, oh, I love this one from Valerie and she asked it a while ago. Is there something about the Fourth Amendment you think you would, you think has been misinterpreted? And I know you talked about a little bit about this yesterday. That's something that maybe we should add to it for clarification. So two-sided question. Yes. Well, of course, I'll throw it back to you because I'm a teacher and that's my job. Is there something <laughs> about the Fourth Amendment that you think has been misinterpreted? And, and I guess I do think that there's certainly an ambiguity about the central question that we began by talking about. To what degree can electronic data that we turn over to third parties be searched by the government in ways that reveal a lot about us. So one of the most cutting edge cases that the Supreme Court recently decided involved the question of whether the government can track your movements in public for more than a month using your cell phone records. When we walk around, our cell phones emit evidence about our location, it's called geolocational information, pinging various cell towers. And using this information, the government asked a suspect's cell phone provider company, Verizon or Comcast or whatever he used, to turn over his records. And as a result, they were able to very minutely reconstruct his movements for an entire month based on this dragnet electronic search. They concluded that he was definitely a drug dealer. They arrested and convicted him. He said the evidence should be excluded because there was no warrant. Uh, the court in a case called US v. Carpenter divided five to four about whether or not there was an unreasonable search. Five justices led by Chief Justice John Roberts uh, cited the example of uh, James Otis and the writs of assistance and said that any electronic search that can reveal a great deal about us, such as the political rallies we visit or the associates we talk to or our uh, hopes and fears or can invade our mental privacy as these dragnet searches can presumptively require a warrant. Uh, five justices, uh, rather four justices said, um, you need physical trespass to trigger the Fourth Amendment. And here it's not clear that there was any violation of anyone's property rights because the doc because the data had been turned over to third parties and under the third party doctrine, it was the property of the companies rather than of the suspect. Now there was a very interesting dissenting opinion by Justice Neil Gorsuch that could have read like a concurrence. He said, I would have joined the majority if the suspect had argued this, but he didn't. He thought, this is back to our initial discussion about terms of service contracts, it's possible that if the cell phone provider was violating the terms of service, then the suspect's property rights would have been infringed. And if the suspect's property rights were infringed, then Justice Gorsuch thought it would have been an unreasonable search requiring a warrant. So back to our initial discussion, do you feel that whether or not the police can reconstruct your movements for a month should turn on which cell phone provider you happen to choose? It might be that Comcast does give you property rights in your data and Verizon or AT&T doesn't, uh, should that be matter, a matter of private contract um, or not? And the fact that, that it's ambiguous about whether the Fourth Amendment as written protects the privacy of our digital effects makes some people, and I guess I'm uh, one of them, uh, think that it might be 
helpful, at least for a clarification, regardless of whether you agree with Justice Gorsuch or Chief Justice Roberts, to amend or clarify the text of the Fourth Amendment to make clear that electronic searches are covered. So now my question is back to you. If you were to propose a very modest amendment to the Fourth Amendment, just insert a word or two, because we don't want to tinker with this canonical constitutional text, what would it be? The Fourth Amendment says the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. What words or word would you add to make clear that searches of electronic data are prohibited? So and there was a couple that, more yeah, you there. guys started answering a couple. Matt said um, police need to come back with a warrant regardless of PC. I'm not sure what PC is, but I get the general gist there. Um, and that was my question to you guys. Have um, And then Craig Snyder's class has another really good question for you when you're ready. <laughs> Probable cla clause needs to be spelled out more. Mm -hmm. Cell phone tracking is prohibited oh. in all circumstances. That's from Cassidy. I mean, Cassidy, that's such a clear, precise way of addressing the problem. It, it exactly makes clear. Uh, you and thank you for answering my question so clearly. Cell phone tracking is prohibited in all circumstances. I guess the follow-up questions would be, do we really want to call out cell phones? Because after all, in about 10 years, we'll probably be tracked in some other way that's not cell phones. So if you get really specific about the technology, then the words aren't broad enough to cover the new technology that will allow similar searches. That's what happened. The court initially confronted wiretapping of telephones, and that was one technology, and now it's cell phones. So on the one hand, great to be precise because it solves the problem, but on another, a bit more abstraction, we'll keep the amendment uh, a, uh, able to evolve. And any data gathered using an electronic devices. Carl, that's a great suggestion, and that also gets at Cassidy's idea by with a slightly more abstract prohibition. And I guess then my question would be, do you really mean any uh, data under all circumstances? Would that include the data that is now considered uh, non-private, like the telephone numbers that we call? And I guess your counter might be, it's hard for us to have a chat discussion, but the argument on the other side would be, well, the prohibition is just against unreasonable searches and seizures. So you might say that certain kind of data gathered using electronic devices uh, is not unreasonably searched uh, when the police just get a few telephone numbers, but it is unreasonably searched when they use those telephone numbers to reconstruct someone's movements over a month. So Carl, I think that's a great suggestion. And this is exactly what the constitution drafters have to grapple with as they think about translating the constitution in light of new technologies. So Jeff, we have like one minute to wrap up. So I wanna definitely do like our wrap up statement. Like what do we have to remember in apl applying it to future us and the fourth amendment? Um, but also uh, Craig's class asked a really good question. And I thought it was interesting. Have you ever had to invoke the fourth amendment? <laughs> um, I have not. Um, I give the advice very uh, cheaply and I just gave it to you. Uh, and and the, the, the advice, um, call your lawyer, is derived more from the Fifth Amendment's uh, Miranda warnings and also from the Sixth Amendment's right to counsel. So um, I have not invoked the Fourth Amendment, but I certainly find myself thinking about it all the time. And it's just so relevant, uh, as you can tell from the cases we've been talking about now. And also, uh, you know, now governments around the world are using cell phone data to reconstruct people's movements in public in light of the virus to figure out who's infected whom. In Singapore, some of that tracking is personally identif identifiable. If the government suspects you of being infected, they can actually track your, I'll say my, Jeff's movements and see everyone I've talked to and everyone I've had contact with. You couldn't do that in the US without probable cause of a crime, but the US government is proposing to use anonymized data and the question of whether or when the platform should be able to turn over that data to reconstruct our movements during the virus is really relevant. What's the takeaway? The yeah, takeaway? what's the big idea that we can apply and think of every time we see something come in the news, something come in, in our community, then when we think about the Fourth Amendment, what's that the line that Madison would want us to hold on to? Well, the line is the text of the Fourth Amendment. So memorize it, at least memorize that first clause. <laughs> memorize you can do it. I, I've got the first bit memorized, of course, because I teach it all the time, but the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects 
against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. There's your takeaway. And then for further reflection, and you have to do a lot of it because these are such hard questions. What does it mean to commit an unreasonable search or seizure of our persons, houses, papers, and effects in a digital age? Do we want to amend or refine that language by saying our persons, houses, papers, or digital effects? Or do we want our justices and judges and citizens to translate the amendment and to ensure the same amount of privacy in the 21st century as John Adams and James Wilkes and James, and, and James Otis were demanding in the 18th century? What's so exciting about the Fourth Amendment is that both uh, conservatives and liberals, constitutional originalists and living constitutionalists agree on the central need to translate the amendment. So it protects the same amount of privacy today as it did uh, at the time of the American Revolution. It's so exciting for all of us to be able to participate in that conversation of constitutional translation so that our liberties, the liberties that sparked the American Revolution remain just as pristine and secure against unreasonable searches and seizures today as they did at the time of the framing. Thank you so much, friends. Tomorrow, we're gonna have so much uh, fun, I think. I know I will. It will Stephanie be so much Sanford fun. <laughs> will because Stephanie Sanford is the vice president of the college board. They're the ones who um, write the AP test. So all of you who are in AP classes and are studying for AP exams, you're going to have the unbelievable opportunity to talk to the person of the college board in charge of writing the test. And she and I are going to run through the major Supreme Court cases that you need to know to prepare for the AP tests. And I know we're going to learn a lot from each other. And I hope you'll enjoy the conversation. So hope to see you tomorrow at one. And if you're not an AP student or a college student or a lifelong learner, it is a great list of 15 cases. So it's going to be fun to watch Jeff go through 15 cases in basically 50 minutes. Um, but so come on in, everybody. It's a great time. It should be really fun. And they're, they're, as Tom likes to always remind me, this great SAT words, canonical cases, the fantastic cases that everybody should know, not just AP students. Thank you guys so much. And yes, we will right. be recording it and uploading all of this. The one o'clock sessions will all be on our YouTube channel and great to have you on. Thank you. Great. Thanks guys. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Curry. <laughs> See you soon. See you soon. Like, have a good one. <laughs> okay. Bye. All my visuals. <laughs> great.